Um, we're going to be talking about Mesopotamian archaeology here, um, but that's really just the example on which I'm building a series of uh, observations on labor capacity in cities. Um, this is a site of Tel Mozan in northeastern Syria, third and second, fourth, third, and second millennia BC. It's a city. Well, actually, it's an archaeological site, which was a city. Actually, it was several cities, one on top of each other. This is something we all know. But the question is how, apart from me saying that it's really big and really important, how, what are the parameters with which we can, that we can use to discuss whether this is a city or not? And what I'm proposing is to use energetics. What is energetics? Architectural energetics is a method wherein buildings are translated into cost estimates in terms of labor time units based on combining the cost of construction tasks per material derived from timed experiments on observations or building activities with a measured or reconstructed volume of those materials in the buildings. Okay, what does that mean in practical terms? How do we do that? Uh, at the site of Tel Mozan, this is a palace, uh, the AP palace dating to the mid third millennium BC. Um, you can see here the plan overlaid on it. It's a large structure, a very important, a royal palace. And it's built of a combination of stone, mud brick, and um, plaster, and uh, roofing beams, and so on. So, this is our point of departure with the various phases that we, that we understand here. How do we go from this to understanding the process of construction? My technique, my suggestion is threefold. A combination of three factors. A chain of artois, uh, algorithms, and a 3D model. So let's take just as one example, one of those elements of, in, this, in the structure that we saw before, the mud brick, the mud brick production. In terms of the chain of artois, we have a combination of how to go about making mud bricks. This we know to some extent from a wide variety of sources, which I'm not going to go into now, but it's experimental, textual, and uh, based on the archaeological record. It mixes the dirt, water, and chaff, carries, fills, lets it dry, stands it up at its side so it dries better, it's ready, and then it can be transported, used, or stored. Now that we've understood the various steps in the process, in one, we're talking only about the mud bricks, let's move to algorithms. So how do we quantify what we, what we just saw? This again is based on an experimental, or uh, moment of experimental archaeology we did at the site, where a portion of uh, one corner of the palace was completely destroyed, and so we've rebuilt it, following as best we can the ancient production techniques. Here you see the brick form. Here the bricks have three different moments of its drawing phases. And here it is for storage. So we can quantify that. Having worked to hand in hand the archaeologists with uh, lo <coughs> local uh, masons, we can, because the modern architecture in the area, village architecture, is also comprised of mud bricks. And so there's the technique, even if there are some um, elements which are quite different, particularly brick sizes, which differ. Um, but that we were able to um, make a brick form which corresponds to the ancient bricks as opposed to the modern bricks. So we can quantify what we, this experiment that we did, saying four people in 12 hours, based over three days, produced a thousand mud bricks of a certain size with a volume of 19 cubic meters. Thus, approximately two and a half person hours are needed to produce one cubic meter of brick. So now we have seen the steps. We have the numbers, and uh, we need the number, sort of a, um, a generalized formula, and now we need the numbers of the volumes. So we have a 3D model. Now, I have the ugliest 3D model you've ever seen, um, and I say that with a certain amount of pride. Because the point is not, um, the point of doing the 3D model, and it's, it's a, I think a relatively rare case, the point of this 3D model, of making the 3D model, is not what you see here. My goal was not to make an image. My goal was these numbers. These numbers give us the volume 
of the archaeological record as well as a minimum of reconstruction. So bringing the wall heights up to us to a even um, height. And that gives us a total number of bricks of um, almost a thousand cubic meters of mud bricks. So by putting that all together, we know that it took around 2,400 person hours to make the bricks that were needed for this palace. That's only one piece of the puzzle of understanding this palace. These are all of the algorithms that I used to um, quantify different aspects of the construction process. <coughs> the sources of the algorithms were, are varied. There are ethnological, exper ethnoarchaeological experiments, as the one we just saw. Some are comparative experiments in other contexts or disciplines, and some are textual data from the same cultural horizon. By putting these three aspects together, we can then understand the energetic cost of a building. But uh, we're here talking about urban settlements and not individual buildings. So how, do, how can we put this together? How can we go beyond single structures to understand urban environments? Now, labor capacity means a lot more just than just the number of people, although that's obviously the key component. It requires a great deal of know-how, and so it requires organizational skills, which at its peak means the, the concept of writing. Because remember, we're talking about the third millennium BC, so we're almost on the cusp uh, between prehistory and history for the region. Um, it also requires a great skill with materials. And now, it just, that just doesn't just mean knowing how to put the pieces together, but it also means a whole structure which, at, again, at its peak, ends with responsibility. So the Codex of Hammurabi, a large section of the Codex of Hammurabi, is ded dedicated to punishing builders whose houses collapse. <coughs> so if a, house, uh, if a man whose house collapses and kills his child, then the, then the, um, the builder will be fined, um, and so on. And there's a whole section in the, in the codex dealing with responsibility. And finally, it requires a great number of tools that are available because, for example, transporting uh, a thousand cubic meters of mud brick is quite a task. And so the, whether one is carrying them by hand, by sled, by wheeled wagon, makes an enormous amount of difference in terms of the labor costs. Um, labor Capacity also leads us to the question of specialization, which feeds nicely into the paper we just heard. Um, the uh, being able to build something in stone, as we as uh, as this palace, means also the ability to quarry large numbers of blocks. Um, it means the the ability to float those stones on waterways to be able to transport them. Um, and so when we're considering labor capacity, it means that we should also, we're also looking at questions of, of specialization. And specialization means not only the ability to do those individual things, but it also means the ability of the society to support people who do just that. So it means that if your main task is going out um, and worrying about your fields, then um, and everybody has to do that, then of course specialization becomes much more difficult and much um, the sort of the bell curve of, of specialization gets much, much flatter. And finally, the understanding labor capacity and the buildings within a settlement can also help discuss the question of surplus and elites within a settlement. And of course, this is one of the main markers for the difference between a settlement and a city. So let's um, follow that, uh, the question of sort of urban, the, the elites and uh, surplus, looking at the growth of cities. And this is um, a quote from Trigger. At the most elementary and general level, political power is universally perceived as the ability to control energy. No ruler can retain political power if he does not invest much of this energy in activities that help to maintain and, if possible, expand the society he controls. Yet the most compelling demonstration of power is the ability of a ruler to consume some of the energy he controls for non-utilitarian purposes. 
So make big, beautiful, useless things. Um, and that leads us to some extent to two different aspects of what we can measure with energetics. So things of such as infrastructure, um, but also the monumental buildings. So the palace that I saw is a non-utilitarian structure in that um, the, there's the adage that um, the king makes a palace, but it's also a palace that makes a king. And so these, uh, this relationship between power and energy is very, very important if, uh, to understanding cities. And we can use energetics to understand on two different levels, a synchronic, so looking at monumentality, the materials, the complexity, and the size of buildings. There's a very nice study that was done um, by Sebastian Haganauer and Felix Levinson on, um, on the Uruk structure, showing that one of the structures there is considerably smaller than the rest, but uses a material which was so much more valuable that it's the most costly building in all of Uruk. This is, again, 4th millennium BC. So, um, so these are the kinds of approaches that can help us talk about um, the, what, what lies behind monumental buildings and cities. And then, of course, there's also the energetic distance between what is monumental and what is private. So that helps talk about, for example, especially the elites. So how much more costly is a palace as, a composed, as opposed to a private house? <laughs> In relatively egalitarian societies, the there wouldn't be a palace, but um, sort of communal structures are much much closer in terms of cost, energetic cost, to a private house than they are in highly stratified societies where a palace, such as the one that I showed you, is much 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 more expensive than um, than a private house. Interestingly, it's uh, this the palace, as much as it costs, is considerably cheaper. Than any of the um, than any of the um, infrastructure projects that were undertaken. So um, I, I also looked at the difference between a palace and a city wall. And the city wall, for a much smaller settlement, is exponentially more costly than built making a palace. So that really brings us back to Trigger's quote. Trigger's quote. It's really that last slice of the pie, that little bit of surplus which the ruler can employ in non-utilitarian things which help us talk about um, political power and urbanization. And of course, that was the synchronic, but also on the diachronic level, we can use this analysis, considering how monumental structures are um, added to a settlement or how they're changed over time. Um, in another session, they were talking about how uh, churches were built one on top of another um, over over a over a period of time, and yes, that's done, but it's not always the same building. It's and we know this from from textual material from the ancient Near East. Each king builds the temple, which just means that they rebuilt the temple or modified it, and um, and they always put something, make it a little bit better. And what is that little bit better? And how much? How can we quantify that little bit better? And how, what does that reflect about the society? about uh, that's there and the um, we can look at the difference between this over time the difference between the investment and in infrastructure versus non-utilitarian structures then um, so in the beginning I talked about the chain of the algorithms and the 3d model now the chain of is something that other people have worked on and it's also quite structure specific the 3D model is, of course, unique to each uh, building. The algorithms are not. The algorithms are something which can be, because of their general nature and because it's a tool for measurement, are inherently as much, and that's a point of discussion maybe we can have afterwards, but um, are inherently general. It can be applied to a wide variety of structures. And so I put together um, NCAB, the Energetic Calculator for Ancient Buildings, which is an online tool, um, an online tool, a library of algorithms where, where people can plug in their own data. So NCAP, the Energetic Calculator for Ancient <coughs> Buildings, provides a library of interactive algorithms, and it also provides research paths combining clusters of algorithms, which basically parallel then chain operatoire 
discusses terminology used, gives bibliography, critique for sources. It's open source, so it allows for changes to the input as well as the program. And it cites the works that use NCAB, of which now there's only one or two, um, providing really a locus for collaboration because these uh, the use of these algorithms are, are a powerful tool because of their ability to compare across within a, within one urban settlement, but also across uh, space and time. Here's just one example showing up talking about how many mud bricks can be made per day with a various um, set of hyperlinks and whatnot you can imagine um, based on material. They're sort of a material source type and geography and whatnot. This means that um, research using these algorithms are reproducible, both on the tool side, where the algorithms and assumptions used to estimate the energetic costs are explicit, as well as on the data side, where when in the published <coughs> algorithms, there is, um, it's quite clear what the source comes from and the original bibliographical reference. NCAM, these algorithms are merely a tool. Um, because it's a tool for measuring. So it's not a solution in and of itself to any problem, uh, which is a good thing, <laughs> because it means that it can be really used in a wide variety of contexts. It provides a bottom-up approach, which links archaeological data and theoretical discussions, which I think is a really very powerful and very important digital tool, which means that we can um, tie discussions of prestige monumentality to the single bricks which make up the, um, the edifices. And I've just added that NCAB is also a locus for discussion in that research using NCAB are listed giving basic information. So another paper talks about knowledge foraging. And in this sense, it, NCAB can be sort of an aggregator for these kinds of questions and the algorithms themselves. Almost done. Um, in the check object integrity, um, the, the discussion of, of, what, um, of what we were going to talk about this year, the questions came up. Can we answer the question of whether our exploits were past the test of time? Are we able to propose comprehensive and functional solutions for archaeology? And I'd like to add, can our current exploits breathe new life into the work of others, of older documentation? Is our work flexible enough to adapt to changing situations? Is it accessible enough that others can use it as a building block? even if technology radically changes. And I hope that NCAB talks to some of these, responds to some of these questions. Thank you, and here's the website.